So I'm Douglas, this is Marco, we're with a company called Shift Crypto, we're co-founders and we make uh, one of the hardware wallets uh, called the Bitbox, um, there's some pictures there. And in this talk, uh, if you're in the last talk, there'll be a little bit of overlap in the beginning, um, but I'll say it in a different way, maybe it's interesting. Um, and we'll talk then, the last talk talked a lot about multi-signature wallets and we're going to talk about some issues that not, surprising security issues that not everyone's aware about that can be fixed. Um, but not, might not be. And so I have a clicker, let me see which one goes where. That worked, okay. And so in this talk, I'll, I'll start talking. Marco will go into the technical details. Um, maybe the first third is on the first points, just a general why use hardware wallets and why use more than one hardware wallet or multi-sig. Um, and I, I like to start, maybe some of you heard this before, but I was invited to a conference a few years ago the keynote speaker was the former head of the CIA, and he said that there's two types of people in the world. What did he say? Those that have been hacked and those that have not yet been hacked. He was later corrected by every other speaker at the conference that there's two types of people in the world, those that know they've been hacked and those that do not yet know. <laughs> and so the take home message of the conference, for me at least, was if you have something valuable on your computer or your mobile phone, it can be easily stolen if the thief is motivated enough. And so this is an example of something that could be valuable on your computer, uh, a different format, uh, a seed for a cryptocurrency wallet. These seeds uh, are storing about a trillion dollars in value right now. So that's you know something valuable a thief might want to take. Um, and then this is the issue. Imagine this key is inside of this red balloon. This red balloon is an analogy for your computer or your mobile phone. And in order to keep it safe, you have to protect the whole surface of this balloon, but a thief only needs to find one little pinpoint and pop it and can access your secrets. Um, and computers and mobile phones, uh, they're actually designed to make this balloon bigger. For example, by giving access to uh, app stores, third-party software that you can download onto your computer. I mean, all, all great things for convenience, but not necessarily good for, for security. And if you think, um, well, I just have my coins in a centralized exchange, it's not on my computer. Well, besides all the risks with exchanges and all the billions and billions that have been lost, imagine you have a perfect exchange with perfect security, um, you still have to log into that, right? And so this was referenced in, in the previous talk where your login details are probably on your mobile phone or your computer, and so you have the same risk there. And in the US you can get SIM swapped and Coinbase has lost uh, funds for thousands of their customers. So, um, oh, can I go back? Yeah, and so the, the general idea here then for security is to make this balloon as small as possible. Uh, maybe use something different than rubber uh, to protect it. And that's the whole idea behind hardware wallets. Um, they're single purpose computers and, and the concept is simple. Generate your secret keys on the device, uh, sign transactions on the device. The keys never need to lead the device. So don't let these keys leave the device where they could be seen by um, hackers or malware hiding on your computer or your mobile phone. So the single purpose computers, um, ideally they're open source, not all of them are. Um, computers and mobile phones, the operating systems have, I don't know, millions, tens of millions of lines of code. They're basically impossible to audit. Uh, and so with open source code, um, people can audit it. You can have some transparency there. Ideally no operating system, and of course, the, the secret's keeping it offline. And so they have two general purposes. Again, generate and store keys offline. So they need a good source of random number generator. Um, I won't go into the details for time. Uh, physical protection, uh, not all hardware wallets um, have that in their threat model, but it, it should be a part of it. And of course, backup and recovery. So generating should be done offline, backup and recovery also. And the other purpose is um, it should be usable. And so. In the last talk, they mentioned the trade-off between um, security and complexity. Uh, to me, that's a false dichotomy, in, in some ways at least. And the job of hardware wallet companies is to make something that's both secure uh, and easy. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to make uh, our device as easy as possible. Um, and receive and send coins, of course. Um, usably, you need, an off uh, you need a screen on the hardware wallet itself. Uh, in order to verify that what you're signing uh, is actually what you um, think you're signing. Uh, our first version of the Bitbox didn't have a screen. Um, we, we've learned this lessons ourselves. 
Uh, and if you don't have a screen, it's basically the same threat model as a software wallet, a hot wallet, because you're trusting what's on the screen of your computer or your mobile phone. Uh, and so moving on to why use multiple hardware wallets. So some risks with single, single signature wallets, so a single hardware wallet or a single software wallet even. So of course, if the seed is lost, uh, your coins are gone. Um, in cryptocurrencies, gone is gone, and Bitcoin gone is gone something that new people in the space don't necessarily understand. Uh, if someone steals the, ste the coins, of course, you, they can steal your uh, coins. If they steal your seed, they can steal your coins. If someone steals your hardware device and unlocks it, or your software wallet, your phone, uh, and unlocks it, the coins are gone also, they can transfer it to their own wallet. And there has to be some trust put into the wallet itself um, to make sure there's no back doors. Um, and so on. We try to address that by uh, being as transparent as possible. And I think here, open source is a, a crucial aspect. So why multi-sig? So I, I think everyone's familiar with what multi-sig is, but basically yeah, have multiple devices, multiple seeds, basically, requiring multiple signatures to secure a single wallet. So you have some redundancy. Uh, it's useful in corporations where um, maybe by policy or legal rules, you need multiple people to sign uh, transactions. Uh, and also non-custody services um, like CASA that was talked about in the past where you can offload one key to a, a third party. They can't access your funds with only that key, but they can help you in recovery situations. Uh, and of course, it's enforced at the protocol level in Bitcoin. So if, as an example of a two of three multisig, so if, of course you can have any M of N multisig up to a limit of 20, around. around 20. <laughs> um, and uh, coming back to the risks with single seed, so multi-sig is designed to kind of protect against that. So if one of the seeds is lost in a 2 or 3 uh, wallet, the coins are not lost. <coughs> if one seed is stolen, the coins are not stolen. If someone steals one device and unlocks it, the coins are not gone, and so on. And um, if you use a multi-sig setup with multiple vendors, so different hardware wallets, you also remove some of the trust uh, required in uh, the manufacturer itself, which I think is a nice thing. Uh, and so just to summarize the multi-sig advantages, um, you distribute responsibility uh, if you have different people holding these different keys, like corporations, for example, and the added security as mentioned before. And so multi-sig promises to solve these problems in theory. So doing multi-sig safely. And I'll hand it over to Marco. Thanks. That one goes forward. And this one goes backwards? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. So I'm an engineer at Bitbox, and I was in charge of working on implementing multisig support in the device. And when I started doing this, I was researching a lot the current ecosystem of multi-signature, especially in hardware wallets. And what I discovered was that I think in practice then, back then, but also still today, it's actually less secure than people assume. Like people assume that if they upgrade their security with multisig with hardware wallets, then they're more secure than before. But I would argue that in some cases it is, like for example, the physical attacks especially, like distribution, catastrophic attacks, et cetera, it is. But I think uh, we are still exposed to remote digital attacks, especially when your computer has malware on it. So I'm gonna explain to you what I found and what I, how I think we should fix it. So to start things off, um, I wanna always assume that if you use a computer or a mobile phone, then you should assume there is malware on it because this is the point of using a hardware wallet in the first place. It should protect you against hacks in your computer. And I will give you two examples of when you are accidentally putting trust into a computer where you should not. And this uh, have two examples of different kinds. One is where the user does it like, accidentally and the other example is where hardware wallet developers accidentally put in too much trust in the computer, which can lead to catastrophic loss. Okay, so first example. Let's say you want to sell some Bitcoin and you want to send the Bitcoin to an exchange for selling. So this is a screenshot of Kraken at the top and the hardware wallet at the bottom, right? And the usual process is you go log into your exchange, you create a deposit address, then you copy that address to your, like it's in, the, in the example of a Bitbox, you go to the Bitbox app, for Ledger it would be Ledger Live and Trezor is Trezor Suit and so on. So you copy over the address, you make the transaction and then on the hardware wallet you will see the transaction details for verification. And this is important because if a computer is hacked, 
then you can't trust what the computer is showing at the top. You have to always trust your device. Okay, so who thinks if you verify this and send the transaction that you actually did the correct thing and everything is safe? Hands up. Okay, who thinks there's an issue with this? Could there go? Okay. Okay, so uh, there's actually an issue with this. So what you are verifying is that you're sending 0 0.01 Bitcoin to this address that you can see, but you're not verifying that this address belongs to Kraken because the computer is showing the address and you cannot trust the computer. So maybe this address shown in the top doesn't belong to Kraken at all. Maybe it belongs to the attacker. So if you send this transaction out, the coins might in fact be lost to a hack. So far, so good. If you have any questions also during the talk, feel free to interrupt. Okay, next example is, uh, so the previous example is, if you know how to use the Harbor Wallet properly, you will not fall to this. But there's also other types of attacks where you have basically no chance because the Harbor Wallet doesn't implement something correctly. <coughs> and that is basically the root of most vulnerabilities that have existed in the past. So here's an example. Uh, everyone familiar with the pass race feature in Bit39 wallets? Like you can have a pass race, and when you enter it, any password that you enter gives you a new wallet. This is good for plausible deniability and for security. And now in the Trezor wallet, you can enter this pass race on the computer. And when you do, the Trezor takes this pass race and then derives your wallet and you can use it. But the problem here is that uh, if the computer takes your pass phrase, for example, Sun is your password, then the hacker can just send Moon to the hardware wallet, and you think you're using this passphrase, but in fact, you're using another passphrase that you don't know about. And then you start using this wallet, you receive coins, you send coins, everything looks totally fine until you have enough coins in your wallet, and then the attacker says, this is enough. Now uh, I will block this, and you have to give me your coins, otherwise, well, you have to give me like a ransom payout, otherwise I will not tell you the real passphrase, and you're locked out. And so this was a vulnerability. I disclosed this to Trezor people through their responsible disclosure program, and they fixed it. The fix is actually easy. You just show the passphrase on the device. So you move basically the trust from your computer to the device, and you can verify the actual passphrase. So if you enter a sun, and then on the device pops up moon, then <coughs> you know, it doesn't check out. It's not actually your passphrase, and you're safe. So I want to quickly, before I go into multisig, explain uh, how single signature receive addresses are generated on a high level. So generally speaking, a hardware wallet protects one seed phrase. And from that, they can derive an extended public key through hashing and some cryptographic operations. And this extended public key represents basically your Bitcoin account. And from that, you can generate, well, the hardware wallet can generate almost an infinite number of addresses. So you can have, you can generate addresses to receive coins on. So the point here is that I want to make, is that the hardware wallet can completely independently generate and display receive addresses without the help of any external thing. Like it doesn't have to get information from your computer or yourself to do this. And then contrast this to multi-signature. So if you see a address like here displayed on the Trezor, or any wallet really, the address is not derived only from the one XPUB. It's derived in part by the XPUB of the device, but also it needs the XPUBs of the other devices that are part of the multisig, either multiple treasures or in this case it's a bitbox and a treasure, doesn't matter really. And so this information is provided by the computer. And as you already might guess from the previous examples, if it's not properly checked on the devices, the computer could mess with this information and, and like, uh, oh, sorry, okay. and manipulate the receive addresses. And now that you also have seen how multisig addresses are generated, here's a common fit pitfall every multisig user should be aware of. So let's say you have a two out of three multisig setup. Did you know that you need all three <coughs> XPUBs to recreate? your funds, not just two out of three. It's because uh, the address is a combination of all three XPUBs. And if you don't know all of them, you cannot recreate your addresses. And if you don't know what your addresses are, you have effectively lost control. So if you use multistick, please back up all three XPUBs at all time. So 
So next I want to show you how Multisig is usually used in practice today and where the issues lie. And for this I will uh, speed run through a tutorial that I find on the internet, it's a random one. And I also want to disclaim that uh, I just picked a random one and Mr. Sunday wrote a, uh, wrote a blog article. I like, couldn't have done a better job in making the tutorial. It's just how the landscape of hardware wallets are and uh, any other tutorial looks like just like this. So let's quickly go through it. So the tutorial uses Electrum as a coordinator. You make a new <coughs> wallet. You give it a name, test multisig. Then you say you want a multi-signature wallet, not a normal signature, single signature wallet. You uh, configure like the M and N, like you want two out of three signatures for every transaction. And then you start adding the hardware wallets. So first one out of three, you add, for example, a Trezor. You say you want a script type, like very detailed native SegWit. And then you add the second hardware wallet, a Ledger, and the third one, which is, a, I think in this case, a call card. And after all of this is done, the wallet has been created and you can see a summary of like the configuration. It's a two out of three native SegWit and all three XPUBs, one per device. In the, oh. You can see down here also there's a specific button for call card to export a configuration, which is, uh, the, the reason is that call card requires you to import this setup into the call card, register the multisig. So you do this. And then the article says, uh, optional but recommended because you know every proper Bitcoiner knows you have to verify and not trust. You can, in fact, verify the XPUBs on the call card. So the controller shows you how to do it. You compare XPUBs. Then it goes on to make a test deposit, right? Just to check that everything is working. Receive some coins, send some coins, sanity checks, very good. Okay, tiny test deposit, re deposit received, zero dot. 0001 Bitcoin have been received, and then we also try to spend them again. <coughs> so you send it to a red, an address, test withdrawal, then because it's a two out of three, it goes to show that you have to sign on two devices, and then everything works. Nice. And then once more with the other combination, Trezor and Cold Card, so you have everything covered. And now you have uh, upgraded your Bitcoin security. Great. Is this setup safe? My question to you. Do you see any problems with this setup? Anything that might have gone wrong? So reminder, the multisig addresses, receive addresses are a combination of all XPUBs of all devices and the threshold. So the main point of attack is that uh, if you have malware on your computer, that malware can replace the XPUBs. And if the XPUBs are replaced, the coins are not in your control anymore. Let's say you have a two out of three multisig, and one XPUB actually belongs to you, but the other two are replaced by a fake Electrum, then the coins sent to these addresses are actually owned by the attacker because he has two out of three keys and you only have one. Yes. So the question. So let's just repeat the question. What's the best practice, in your opinion, to also avoid that, right? To, to avoid having a compromised wallet. Because if I buy it in the store, I don't know what's the history of the device. If I get it from the the guy that created it on his, on his website, I don't know if the the guy from the post office switched it, right? right. So, so I, I'll repeat the question for the stream. So the question is, uh, what happens if you receive a <laughs> fake device in the first place and how can you protect against that? I would say this is kind of out of scope of the art of the speech, but in general, I mean, you can do all sorts of things. For example, using multi-vendor multisig, then you like distribute the trust. You should make sure to get it as you know the hard wallet as closely from the source as possible, and so on. But we can talk more later about this. 
Okay, so this is a remote attack, right? So if the Electrum can replace two out of three x pubs and you receive coins, they are not in your control. The other option is if you have, for example, a two out of two multisig and one x pub is yours, but one x pub is uh, replaced by the malware, then you have shared custody with the attacker, which is a ransom situation. So the, the attacker just says, none of us can have the coins, but you can have them back if you give me half of it or 90% of it or whatever. Okay, so you now might think, oh, okay, XPUBs, problem easy, I will just verify the XPUBs on the hardware, and then I'm safe, right? Because uh, in fact, the tutorial did this. Uh, but uh, here you have a problem again, because let's say you compare the XPUBs from the hardware wallet to the screen, you still trust the screen. Like, how can you tell that the XPUBs shown on the left side here from Electrum are actually the XPUBs that belong to the respective devices? You actually can't tell. Like, it's a, yeah. So what you should be doing instead is uh, verifying the X pubs against what the other hardware wallets show on their own respective screens, because this is what you should be able to trust. But then we have uh, various obstacles to doing this in practice. So I wrote this blog post in 2020, and I think partly in due to the blog post itself, uh, a lot of vendors have improved their game, and this table is already out of date. So there's more check marks now than there was before, which is great. Uh, but generally, like uh, if you want to display X pubs on the device for comparison, like first follow some hard wallets simply don't just don't support it. And uh, one big problem is the bottom row, which is registration of the setup in the device. Let's say you have a treasure which doesn't do any registration of the multisig. That means that every time you make a receive address you have to compare all XPUBs again, because every time you make a receive address, you show it on the screen, you can't tell if the XPUBs that are used in by the hardware are actually legitimate. So you have to go, in Trezor you can click like in the receive screen on the button QR code, and then you can actually see behind the XPUBs that are powering this, is making this address. So you'd have to verify it every time, which is not something I believe anyone is really doing in practice. Most people are probably not even aware that this feature exists. Uh, the tutorial also did a test interaction. Like most people think, okay, I, whatever the problems are with XPUBs, if I just receive and send and it works, it must be correct, right? Like well, how can that not, not be correct? And the surprising thing is that shocks people every time I tell them is that uh, malware can simulate the whole thing from start to finish. You can have a whole multi-six setup. You can receive coins. You can spend coins, sign them on the hardware, and everything is simulated. Nothing is real. The keys belong to the attacker. The signatures that you made with the hardware are just thrown out and the attacker puts in their own. They just wait and wait until you have like a huge stash, like ignoring the test transactions and then they strike. So it's a big concern. I mean, you should obviously do test transactions for sanity checks, but it's not a reliable security feature or security measure. So what can you do today to, so First of all, if you're using multisig privately with one computer, then you're uh, potentially affected and you should uh, change your behavior if you haven't been aware of these problems. So one thing you can do to effectively mitigate those problems is to verify the receive address that you generate, not just on one device, but on all the devices every time you make one. Because if every device shows the same address and every device knows their own XPUB and you see like a two out of three or whatever, then it means all the XPUBs are legit. And this only works if you have everything in the same location. If you have like a hardware wallet in one location and one in a different location, then obviously this is not workable. Impossible, yeah. And the other thing you can do is to, like as an alternative, is to actually diligently verify all the XPUBs correctly at setup time, and then in the future, all the receive addresses are safe, but only if the device can register and store this information from the setup in the first place. And so Ledger <laughs> has an orange mark there because they didn't, they weren't able to do this, but they're, they're working on Bitcoin app 2.0, so they're in the process of fixing all of this. In the Trezor, there's still no registration, and Bitbox and Colcard do the registration. And uh, even if you do verification of the XPUBs, in practice, it's still very difficult, I would say, because you have to not trust the electron computer, you have to verify against the other hardware wallets, but the process in most 
software was like a lectrum is not made that you can actually do this. It's like you have to do it manually somehow, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, still today. Also, UX is bad because uh, you have to compare, for example, in a three out of five, you have to compare five X pubs on five devices. It just takes forever, and they're long strings. It's very annoying. So, to fix all of this, uh, there's actually a better way, right? Instead of, uh, so let's put it this way a bunch of hardware wallet vendors and Hugo from Nunchuck have realized that this is a huge UX nightmare and a security issue. And we have come together to write a new BIP proposal, like it's a Bitcoin improvement proposal. And it's about secure setup of multisig. And so the goals are basically just to remove expert verification altogether because this is the real problem of the security I was telling you about. And also just make it very easy to use because uh, complexity is the enemy of security. And so we observed that if every hardware wallet in the multisig setup checks that their own XPUB is part of the multisig setup, which every hardware wallet has to do, and you display to the user, like, hey, you're making a two out of three and not a three out of five, whatever, you, you check the configuration. And then you check the first receive address on every hardware wallet at setup time. Instead of doing it every time, you just do it once at setup time. And all the hardware wallets store this information for future then we have solved the problem. So this would be, if all the hardware wallets vendors implemented this, you could have a setup where you have, you don't even see any XPUBs, which would be awesome. And it's very easy to do because you verify only one address. Like it's very easy to just compare it to three or five devices. And then in the future, you can use any one of the devices to make receive addresses, verify them safely without any worries. And for the sake of time, I will not go into the details, technical details. We can talk about it later if you want. But let's leave some time for uh, questions. Yes, uh, sorry. <coughs> I will ask another question uh, here. Uh, couldn't this just be fixed by using uh, freshly uh, set up devices that are only offline and I'm talking about the computers. Uh, each computer being used with one hardware wallet, always offline. Uh, Electron, for example, downloaded, uh, built from source and no risk of malware there. Uh, that would imply that the setup is clean and there is nothing to check every time. Because the, the, we are pretty, we can be pretty confident there that nothing is compromised, right? Yeah. So the whole talk basically focuses on the issue that if you use one coordinator, like one electron, to set up your multisig, then you're in trouble. If you use multiple computers and you cross-check everything, it's better. And if you have, if you're sure that the devices are clean, then obviously it's safe. But then, if you're sure of that, then you. But then that avoids every further verifications, right? You, you basically you. You yes. do big, yeah, okay. Yeah, if you are sure that your computer is safe, then it's safe, yeah. Yeah. Then you don't have to verify. My question is, uh, when you are changing from one signature configuration to multisig, for instance, from Tracer to your system, do you need to do a Bitcoin transaction, or you can keep in the same, uh, you, you can still keep the original 24 uh, word seed, but uh, having it uh, uh, replicated in the multi-sig uh, configuration. So if you already have a single signature seed, in technically you can use it also as a part of a multi-signature, so I would not necessarily advise for it because it's better to just segregate things. Like if you have a single signature and multi-signature, it's just better to segregate it for to not overload the complexity, because if it's you know a complex system, it's easier to make mistakes. But it's technically possible. Yeah. I am thinking in a system designed for inheritance. For instance, you you want to keep your secret key, uh, key but you want to distribute the multi-sig system to your <coughs> beloved uh, payments. Question was about inheritance. Um, 
So I'm not quite sure what you mean with this, but I think I, I mean you can use probably multisig to to inheritance. In, you can give some keys to your heirs already, and so on. Yeah. So the question, the my original question, you you can can you keep your uh, uh, you don't really need to do a, trans, a Bitcoin transaction. So you if you want to go from single signature to multi signature, you do have to make a transaction because ah. it's a totally separate uh, wallet with different addresses, and you cannot mix them. So you cannot spend your okay. Yeah, okay, okay. If that was the question. Yeah, um, I, you were speaking a lot about uh, multisig, and I think some of the issues could be solved by using Schnorr-based music. Um, but I don't know what, what's the state there. Maybe threshold signatures are miss, missing or something. So could you tell me about uh, when Schnorr signature or multi Schnorr music is coming to hardware wallets? Uh, I. I think Schnorr-based music is not coming to hard wallets anytime soon because they have a lot of downsides. Mm -hmm. They have the upside that on-chain is only one signature and less footprint and better privacy. But uh, the flip side is that you can, for example, only do N of N. That means like two out of two or three out of three or four out of four multi-six, which is usually not a good configuration because you always want to have like a two out of three, for example, so you have actually some redundancy. And I'm not quite sure. I think probably the issues that I described apply equally to this setup because they're also made from different keys. So you also have, a, have to have a setup phase, which probably should look similar to BIP 129. But I would have to double check that. Just a little bit following up on the previous question, um, Schnorr signatures, but not music, just simple Schnorr signatures. When do you think uh, hardware wallets will integrate those? They are integrated in most, well, not, maybe not most, but some. Bitbox does support Schnorr signatures. It's a part of the Taproot feature in Bitcoin. So if you use Taproot with Bitbox, you're using Schnorr signatures. Given what you just explained, what is your recommend recommendation right now? So is, is multisig too dangerous, so it should not be used, or what do you think? I would say uh, it's obviously a complex question. So uh, it, it, I mean, multisig has very important benefits, especially like removing single points of failure, what Lop talked about in this talk. That's very important. I would say if you have I would say in the current landscape of hardware wallets, if you use it, you should definitely be educated and follow the advice that I presented, especially verifying receive addresses on every device every time. And then it's, I think, good. Being aware of the other pitfalls, for example, that your backup is correct, you have the descriptor backed up, including all XPUBs, and so on. So I think if you educate yourself and test a lot, I think it's a good thing. But I would uh, recommend still that people stick to a single signature until like the experience is better, which hopefully should come in the following years. Yeah. This website has a blog, and most of what I talked about is also in the blog. Yeah, so I just have a question regarding the, the coordination file, or you say you have to, of course, have the output descriptor saved. But you also say you additionally that you have to store the Xbox, is that correct? Yeah, Hours of the convenient. The, uh, the, the descriptor, in fact, contains the Xbox. Yeah. So if you have the descriptor, you have the Xbox saved too. Okay. The only thi thing you have to be aware of is you should uh, store the descriptor with every backup of every private key. Because if you, for example, have two out of three and you want to recover, you lose one coin completely, like the bank shuts down and you cannot access your safe. You should be able to recover with two out of three, right? But if you don't have all three XPUBs, or in this case, the full output descriptor, you're lost. You cannot recover. So you have to have this backed up 
All right, thank you. So, so would you well, recommend? Would you recommend that you have? Let's say you have uh, three times the twenty-four seed words. Uh, you have stored, and then you have three different uh, hardware devices, and you store them maybe six different places, and and you would then leave a copy on an, a USB of the output descriptor, along with every uh, like piece of seed and every piece of hardware. Yes, like the, be the danger of losing the descriptor is privacy leak. Like yes. people know what you have, but uh, otherwise it's safe to replicate as much as you can. So I would definitely store so that, it okay. redundantly. Yeah. Thank you. So, hello. Uh, if you recommend a single seek, uh, <clears throat> how about uh, uh, Shamir backup? Uh, uh, for this single seed, I think it's a good idea. Um, usually, I say multi signature is better than Shamir because it solves all the problem of Shamir and more. Because uh, in Shamir, when you sign a transaction, the key has to still be assembled in a single location. For example, if you have the backups distributed, but you want to use the key to actually receive, ad well, not receive to send coins, you have to have the key in one location, for example, in your treasure in case of slip 39. So then it's again a single point of failure at this stage. So if there's a vulnerability in the hardware wallet, it could maybe leak and then it's game over again. So Multisig would solve all these issues as well. But I would say Multisig is UX wise not quite ready <coughs> yet. So I think in the meantime, uh, Shamir secret sharing, especially slip 39 is a good idea. And uh, wait until Multisig is more mature, I would say for the and individual consumer.